As Fright Fest is rolling up on a close here, it's time to talk about a book that is scary enough to raise the dead. And as we know, sometimes dead is better. It's probably wrong to believe there could be any limit to the horror which the human mind can experience. On the contrary, it seems that some exponential effect begins to obtain as deeper and deeper darkness falls. As little as one may like to admit it, human experience tends in a good many ways to support the idea that when the nightmare grows black enough, horror spawns horror. One coincidental evil begets another, often more deliberate evils, until finally blackness seems to cover everything. And the most terrifying question of all may be how much horror the human mind can stand and still maintain a wakeful, staring, unrelenting sanity. Hey, what's up, bookworms and constant readers? Mike back one more time to go into the multiverse, the last into the multiverse of October, and that is to talk about the 1983 novel Pet Cemetery by Stephen King, widely regarded as one of the man's best. This was published uh, under his unknown, 10th novel, rather, published under his own name. If you don't know Into the Multiverse, I'm going through his novels in publication order by his own name. Richard Bachman stuff will be coming later, so if you're looking for Long Walk, that is the question I get the most. Where is Long Walk? I will get to that much later. But this is obviously one of his most popular novels. I think even people who haven't read King have heard of this one. It's, it spawned two films, a radio drama, and even a hit song by the Ramones. I use the term hit song lightly. Uh, uh, it was written actually a very uh, few years earlier. Many stated back to 1979 is when he started writing this book. Finished it, and to his own words, uh, it scared him so much he put it in a drawer and never planned to release it. Now, his uh, his contract was coming up with Doubleday. He kind of was ready to get away from that. They didn't have a very good uh, a very good parting, and he still owed them a book. So he asked Tabitha, his wife, to read it and see what she thought. And she said, look, it's it's messed up. It's a very good story, though. And I do think you should go ahead and release it. And here we are now. It's one of his most popular books. So quite a fun story. I mean, if you want to talk about fun being a, a, a word I use lightly there, uh, he said to the day, it's, it's the only time he's ever written anything that scared him. And I don't feel like that's a line. I can see as a parent why the story really, really messed with him and uh, why he thought maybe that might just be a, I kind of took it a little too far is the way he put it. And I, I can see that. It was inspired by real life events, actually. You know, he did uh, have a house where, uh, you know, trucks or vehicles always drove by really quickly. And it was inspired by his daughter's cat dying. And it also uh, were his, his youngest son. I think, think it was Owen, not Joe. Owen was actually about to run out on the road and he had to like dive and save his kid from actually getting hit by the car. And what he has said is, you know, what really was going through his head? What if I hadn't? And that's where the, uh, the, the, the genesis for the story came up. So you see very real events that he likes to write into his stories. That's why a, a lot of these protagonists are always writers. But Lewis isn't for a change. But I, I read this first time, uh, 15 years old, during my Great Awakening, as I call it. That was where I read all of the Stephen King stories that were released uh, up until 1993, besides Dark Tower. Uh, it was what they had at my public school library, and that's when I became a constant reader. But uh, yeah, I read this again in my late 30s after having kids, and it was a very, very different experience for me. So I want to kind of talk about what it was like reading as a teenager who was all in for the scares and what it was like reading as an adult who was actually terrified of something other than just the supernatural. So we will get into it like we always do by talking about what is it about, guys? Now, when Lewis Creed takes a new job and moves his family to the idyllic rural town of Ludlow, Maine, this new beginning seems too good to be true. Despite Ludlow's tranquility, an undercurrent of danger exists there. Those trucks on the road outside the Creed's beautiful old home travel by just a little too quickly, for one thing, and as evidenced by the makeshift graveyard in the nearby woods where generations of children have buried their beloved pets. Then there are the warnings to Lewis, both real and for beyond the depths of his nightmares, that he should not venture beyond the borders of this little graveyard, where another burial ground lures with seductive promises and ungodly temptations. A blood-chilling truth is hidden there, one more terrifying than death itself, and hideously more powerful. And that takes us, guys, to the pet cemetery. 
I think that this is a story that just about everyone has heard of. So while this is going to be non-spoiler, like all my Into the Multiverse stuff is, uh, there's some things I feel like are just ingrained in our pop culture at this point. So if you're like, hey, I didn't know blank happens, well, I, I don't know what to tell you. This is almost a 40-year-old story. I feel like just about everyone knows it. If, it. if it's been parodied by The Simpsons, I feel like almost everybody knows it. So uh, let's get into what makes it good or bad. Uh, this is going to sound weird that I'm putting this under good. But I don't think there's any novel out there that can get through the profound sense of loss like this book can and how it affects the human psyche. Losing a family member is traumatizing. Losing a child is earth shattering. It's something that you cannot put into words, you know, just the idea of it. It's just one of those things where you think, you know, no parent should have to bury their child, right? So I think that's what makes this book absolutely just so visceral and so real. And it really gets to just how horrible uh, a loss of a family member can really just mess up an entire family, not just, you know, a, a singular person. And I definitely put that under a good here because it's just he is able to get that through in ways that I don't feel like very many authors ever have besides saying, and then they were sad, you know, and then they had a mourning period. Okay, let's fast forward three months later. No, this goes through the days after this profound sense of loss. And it really hits home that idea that family matters most. You know, through all the bad stuff that the Creed family goes through in this book, the one message you always see is, look, no matter how bad everything's going, it, it doesn't matter as long as I'm with my family, as long as my family is safe. And that's what Lewis is really battling with this whole book is, you know, the idea of, of losing his family. This really, it does feel like the, uh, the, the whole idea of, of a kid's childhood being over when they realize that someday they're going to die. It really hits a lot of those themes that I think that, uh, you know, f a family has to go through with their children. You know, it's like telling them that Santa Claus ain't real. You guys didn't know Santa Claus wasn't real. Sorry to spoil that for you. <laughs> I hope there's not anybody under 10 watching this channel. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's one of those things I look at now as a parent and be like, okay, try to tell your kids, you know, hey, there's no Easter Bunny uh, is not quite the same as saying, oh, yeah, by the way, we're all going to die. And that's that's a, a, something that you can tell that the, the creeds are really tiptoeing around here and they feel like, hey, it's time for us to talk to our kids about that. And they use, you know, the death of a pet to kind of get that across. And then it just kind of keeps going further and further in that downward spiral. But the real crux of this book guys is just how far would you go to bring back a loved one uh it's it's something that you think like i said i read this when i was a teenager and it's something that you think hey man use your head when you're a parent you can't think rational about something like that there is nothing that you would not do to protect your child or to keep them forever right nothing so uh, you think about just like an empty nester, how 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 basket case they could be. Uh, imagine the child is being completely ripped away from them. It's it's just it's something you can't really understand. So you have kids of your own. Because I read this as a teenager, I was like, ah, that sucks. But Lewis, what are you doing, man? You know, the whole time as a parent, I'm like, can't say I'd do anything differently, really. So it, it's it's uh, an examination of how much parents can really fear losing their children. You know, you, we hear all this thing about like helicopter parents and stuff. We, we've been like, you know, I don't want to be a helicopter parent, but I'm like a lie. My heart still, every time my kid's playing out with his friends outside unsupervised, it's still, I mean, he's eight, you know, and I still, I still am a nervous wreck when, uh, when I don't have an eye on him because I read stuff like this, like an idiot. But, uh, I think another good thing here is it, it, King's writing in this one. I talked in different seasons about how people always kind of like trash his prose, and even King is kind of used to a little bit of self-deprecation on his prose. I, I think it's wonderful here. Uh, it's wonderful in a, a beautifully dark way. It's it's very, very sinister. But I really think one of the biggest ones in here that really surprises me is his use of pretense. He writes things that the reader already knows, yeah, this isn't happening. What are you doing right now? And he paints this absolutely beautiful picture of what this person's future would have been like. And it's just absolutely devastating. Tears. I'm not even kidding. It really will get them out of you because you realize what should have been in a normal world and it isn't going to be. And it's just absolutely crushing. Now, if you're here for the scares, guys, this book has them in abundance. Uh, I think that Zelda is one of the most terrifying characters that King has ever written. I thought that before I saw the 1989 movie, which made her even more scary. <laughs> I did read this book before I saw the movie. I, I didn't see it. 
full disclosure here, I grew up in a very, very strict household as a kid. We weren't allowed to watch Pet Cemetery when it came out, and it was really popular. So I read the book four years later, and then I watched the movie at a friend's house because I had to keep this stuff a secret even at 15 years old. But uh, yeah, Zelda, absolutely just a horrifying, horrifying character. And you kind of think it's one of those kind of things that uh, when I talk about like family matters, uh, well, yeah, family matters. And sometimes we have to do things we don't like, even if they're absolutely terrifying. And I don't want to spoil anything for you. Just know that what she has, uh, Rachel has to do with, with Zelda is just, it's just scary stuff. And it's, it's something that's very real that you wouldn't even have considered before. I don't know where he pulled this one out from. But yeah, Zelda, absolutely bone chilling. And there's nothing supernatural about her. You know, that's what makes it even scary. I always say that the, the, the supernatural beings in the books, yeah, they're pretty creepy. The humans in those books usually are way more scary than the monsters. And, and this one, Zelda, very much hits that. I think a lot of his, his confrontations with Pascal, each one is just more and more bone chilling. I, I'm talking about my Fear Factor rating here. And uh, if you watch my Haunting of Hill House review, you know I gave it a 9. And that's been the highest I've given a book. This one is without a shadow of a doubt a 10. This is one of the scariest books ever written. And it's that scary on numerous levels. It isn't just, you know, the gore. It isn't just the scare, the jump scares. It isn't just like the dread. It is so many different things. Everything from what I just mentioned to how scary it is being a parent of children and fearing for their safety. It hits so many levels of fear that uh, I, I think everything I've talked about with, with Lovecraft, everything I've talked about with Mary, with Mary Shelley, what I've talked about with Shirley Jackson doesn't hit anything with the fear and just sheer terror that this book can bring out of you. And I think even at this age where I've said, hey, once you're over the age of like 12, can anything really scare you? Yeah, this can scare you in different ways. I think so. And I just can't say it enough. Uh, I wouldn't give out a 10 in this where I'm saying like, you're going to be shitting your pants if I didn't mean it. And I I, I think it's going to hit everyone a little differently, but like I said, it scared me as a teenager and it scared me as an adult because of different reasons, and I think that's just the depth to this book overall. A couple more uh, good things. I really like the relationship between Lewis and Judd, just the idea of, I, I grew up, you know, Gen X, where it seems like now everyone's really kind of just like keeps to themselves, and Gen X is like, you knew your whole neighborhood, you know, if you lived in the suburbs, you, you knew your neighbors, at least your immediate neighbors and stuff like that, and, and just the relationship between Lewis and Judd basically becoming like best friends, drinking together, you know, where he's almost taking like a grandfatherly kind of presence around Lewis's kids and stuff like that and the kids grow to love Judd and stuff like that it just really very much felt like part of the family so I, I really liked you know the bromance there really made some of the implications that happened later in the story really really difficult to read I think the history that he puts behind the cemetery there's a lot of uh backstory to some of the things that have happened with the cemetery not just necessarily about how it got there or how it started but some of the some of the uh, precautions, some of the warning signs, some of the reasons why, hey, you should never mess with this kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's deep. I think some of those stories that Judd tells about about some of the events that happened with the cemetery actually might be scarier than some of the present day events. It's just some terrifying stuff, and I can't believe that both movies have left that stuff out. But uh, again, I I can talk about those movies for a while. But just know that neither one of those movies have caught exactly how you feel reading this book where you just feel like Ugh. you know you just can't get over it. but again the ending for this guys holy hell this ending uh i've ranted before about how i think people that complain about king not being able to write an ending i think it's greatly overstated there are some where you're like what was he thinking there there's some like uh i i don't know i feel like he's damned if he does damned if he doesn't uh it's either it's too happy or it's too bleak uh this one uh, the third the third thing is always it's too ambiguous. This one, I feel like he leaves a lot up for your interpretation. But if you've been reading the same book that I am, you know what happened, <laughs> okay? He just doesn't spell it out for you. So it kind of feels uh, cliffhangery to stuff, some people, not me. I mean, I obviously I knew what happened. And uh, let's just say it wasn't good. And that leads me to the bad. If, if there is a bad, this could be bad for you. This is not bad for me. I think this is a wonderful, wonderful book on so many levels. So if I've got to nitpick it here, it is very bleak. I, of all of his stories, I feel like this is the one that you're going to leave and not feel a shred 
of good vibes from it. You're going to feel like you need to go take a shower because it's just, if Grimdark and Horror had a baby, it's this book, man. It is just absolutely devastating on every level. I don't feel like there's anything in here that you can be like, you know what, that's just a feel-good part of the story in here like at all. I, I can't see any of that. Uh, but again, that isn't a bad to me. It just might be to some people. If you're you know, optimistic and bright and full of hope and all that stuff and nothing bad will ever happen, yeah, it might be a little too much for you. Uh, I, I think I saw some people that read it for the first time on the Discord server that said it just kind of unsettled them and it made them uncomfortable. That's good horror. That's what it does. That's what it makes you feel like. It makes you feel uncomfortable, unsettled. And uh, it, this book does that in spades for sure. Uh, another criticism I see a lot is that this is just a retelling of The Monkey's Paw from like 1901 or 2 or something like that. Look, I've never read Monkey's Paw. I, I, I know the gist of it. And I know that this was, uh, he, even he has said it was a retelling of it. So I, I, can, I can get down behind that. I can't really make a real criticism out of that because I haven't read The Monkey's Paw. So I, I don't really know. But uh, many consider that book scarier than this one. And me talking this month about several classic, you know, 100, 200 year old horror stories and talk about how unsettling they are, I could, I could see that might be the case. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll make it a point to read Monkey's Paw. But uh, I can't really make that a knock against this book that I absolutely adore for very, very weird, sick reasons. <laughs> uh, I can't really put that knock against it. So let's get into why you should read it, guys. I mean, look, chances are you've heard of it. I mean, like I said, my mom would not touch Stephen King stuff if she was on her deathbed. But even she's heard of this story, okay? I don't think there's anyone who has not heard of Pet Cemetery and knows the basic gist of what it is. You know, something dies, you bury it here, it might come back, but it doesn't come back right. Uh, so I, I think that uh, there's a reason that people still talk about this story almost 40 years later. And uh, there's another reason that it seems like just about every constant reader that you can find, and that means you've read 80% of Stephen King's library, they almost routinely have this in their top five, always. I do, just about everyone I know does, that, that is big Stephen King fans. It deserves the legacy that it has. And I think that uh, you will find that it every bit meets the hype. But uh, yeah, I, I can't recommend enough that you guys pick this up. If you're looking to be scared, here's the thing. I question I get the most is where should I start with Stephen King, Mike? And I always tell them different seasons. That's the best place to go because it's not overly scary. It's not super YA or anything. It's just right in the middle. It gets you into his writing style. It shows you the many different layers that he can write at. But if you're looking to be scared and you don't want to read a 1,300-page story like it, I think Pet Cemetery is the best place to start if you're just looking for the master of horror. This is the place to start. It's going to give you some goose flesh, I feel sure about. As for my final thoughts here, look, I think this is a book that's every bit as good as its reputation. It will make you want to run to your children and hug them. <laughs> and if you don't have them, it'll make you question if you should have them because you'll be absolutely a nervous wreck. Like I said, I think there's a reason that people still talk about this book after all this time. And it really examines that fine line between sanity and just how far would you go. All right, that's all I got for now, guys. This is going to be kind of the spoilery part because I'm going to talk about some connections. When I did Cycle the Werewolf, I was stunned that there were no connections that I could think of, but this one has a bundle of them. So if you haven't read the multiverse, and that means pretty much his entire works, there's a risk you could be spoiled with some of these, so proceed at your own caution here. Now, there's one before I get going here I want to talk about that has not ever been confirmed or denied by King himself, and that is that Ellie, that's uh, Gage's sister, is that she has the shine. It, there's every sign in this book is that she has the shine. And I don't know if King was just afraid to commit to that. He felt like that was maybe too handed in trying to connect his universe, or he just wanted to not take the, take the shine off of this book and, and put it on another one. But it very much seems the way she's communicating with Pascal, the way she knows things that she shouldn't be knowing, that I think maybe she has the shine. So uh, again, that's kind of an unconfirmed connection there, but uh, many, many a King fan have that theory. But let's go on with the actual confirmed ones here. Cujo is the first one. You have Judd mention a, a St. Bernard that went rabid downstate a couple of years ago. That one's quite obvious. Uh, Salem's Lot, when Rachel is rushing back to Maine, she does see a street uh, exit sign for uh, Jerusalem's Lot, as we all know. Uh, and 
I might be remembering this wrong, but I feel like she's saying she's compelled to go there. So I don't know if that's like some of the the, the vampire lure or something like that. I don't know. I might, I might be remembering that one wrong. Now you got it. And I think there's one part where Lewis is just kind of thinking, daydreaming. And I think he's thinking about Derry. I believe it's because like it was either going to be Ludlow that they were going to move to or it was going to be Derry. That was the places that they looked at. I might be wrong on that. But uh, Mount Hope Cemetery, that's a big one. That's where Gage is originally buried. That's also the same place where Georgie Dimbro for, was, was, was buried from it. So a uh, nice little connection there. I think Mount Hope's actually showed up in a, a, a bunch of these books. I think maybe. No, there's a different one for Dead Zone and Carrie, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, Insomnia, you got uh, what? Atropo? Is that his name? Atropo? Uh, in his apartment, he does have the shoe that uh, Gage Creed had after his accident when he gets hit by the truck and the shoe goes flying. Uh, so that's uh, that was one of those kind of things. I was like, how how did you get this? <laughs> right? Uh, the dark half, you do see uh, that Thad does see a speeding uh, Orenco truck going by while he's standing on his porch. And then, of course, you have the girl who loved Tom Gordon. And you have the Wendigo as a very major player in that story. Just like in this one and guys that is what i have that is pet cemetery one of the finest stephen king stories out there that i cannot recommend enough i hope you guys will read it if you have a drop in the comments let me know what you think and i will talk to you guys there